We're going to take about five, ten minutes on questions for the last presentation, and then we'll move on to the final two presentations. Yes, please. I know that people want to go home at the designated time. Thank you for coming back to the final session, if you can take your seats. So we're going to take a five, ten minutes for questions and answers on this presentation, and then we'll proceed to the final two presentations. So does anybody have any questions, and is somebody walking around with the microphone? Here we go. There's a question here. Just, uh, uh, I'm Pierluigi, we met you. Just a small remark about your example, including variables V1 to V6 uh, and Y. Why only V2 and V1 and V2 are relevant? Because if you try to is, consider instead of PDV1, V2 up to V6, consider simply its expectation, conditioning of V1 and V2. If you estimate only that expectation, on one hand you remove bias as well. On the other hand, we have less parameters, we, hence less variance. OK, just this. Just to explain uh, the This is perfectly correct. Yeah, yeah, this is perfect. Thank you, David. It was very clear and very interesting. Uh, closely related to is, uh, I mean, the example makes uh, makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I think that the main reason why you want to find a good model for PK, even if YK only depends on V1, V2, is that usually you're not focusing on just the estimate on one total of Y. So the idea of getting the right model for PK, at least in, also in the calibration world, was, okay, you, either you get the good outcome regression model for YK, but then you need a, a separate one for each of your y, or you just get the model for pk right, and then you can use that to reduce uh, the bias for all the y's. And I think that um, the, ex the example that you showed with um, regression trees was exactly that example, because if you select the wrong covariates, then your bias goes up again. So that would be just like one. Um, and uh, I'm sure you know the, the paper. There's a, a paper a long time ago by Jean Opsumer and, and Miller in which for the um, kernel regression uh, response propensity, 
they were loose, uh, looking at cross-validation, but based on the MSC of the estimator, because in our world. Uh, and then I was thinking, at the end, you were mentioning the test set for selecting the hyperparameters of the linear combination or exponential combination. Can't you just use the test set for MSC estimation? I mean, the classical Horvitz-Thompson variance and tuning that. Uh, yeah, so, so the, the, the example with V1, V2, V3 is a, is a toy example. Of course, in practice, you have 100, you know, we have 50 variables, 100 variables. Um, and, but very often people focus, so they, they will use paradata, for example, right? And we, we have seen at StatCan, people put a lot of variables in the model, and especially paradata, and then you realize all the paradata, they, they don't explain any of the Y variables. So this is when you, you know this is where you don't want to put the variables. Uh, um, so 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 we, we had this example where people were very happy. They said we have 32 variables in the model, and we have uh, you know they did a logistic regression, diagnostics, or my, you know they, they are square very high, and then they had to eliminate all the paradata. So so we, they they, le they were left with a very small number of uh, predictors. So uh, so the toy example is just to say. Keep in mind the Y variables. Now, another way to, to do when you have multiple Ys, one thing you, you could do is model the Ys versus the response indicator. But you cannot do that for all the Ys, but let's say important Y variables. You, you, you identify three, four, five variables. You do a regression model between Y and predictors, right? And then Y1 and the predictors, Y2 and different predictors, different models. And then you use a model calibration type procedure to create one single weight that are based on all these different, but you cannot do that for 100 variables because at some point you, and I think you've worked on this, right? Uh, for model assisted, uh, as you mentioned, but you can. So this is, um, and finally the question on aggregation, can we use the test set? Maybe, yeah, I, 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 I don't know, but the problem is, uh, yeah, so, so the problem is the instability of the, you know, bio square term, right? And, and uh, so, you know, we did some trials and, it, it's not that easy, right? Uh, every time we, you know, we do an estimation of the MSC, then you lose a bit, right? So this is where it's not, uh, uh, it's not very good. But can we use the test? Set? Well, maybe it's a good uh, solution. I don't know. Oh, but I mean, this is the, the to, to respond. Yes, you, you're perfectly right. This is the explanation, and uh, but uh, uh, but. Uh, the, the, the toy example was just to show that what people did in practice is try to have the best predictive model. And, and so, and, and with machine learning, you have very good prediction. This may, you know, may give you a lot of instability. That's what I wanted to show. Li Chan? Okay, so, uh, yes, thanks, uh, David. Very interesting talk, I think. It's uh, uh, um, uh, thought provoking because you, you get a lot of ideas. I, but I don't know if I should say so much because you, then you run away and run the, uh, write the papers. Uh, so, one thing, is the, uh, one thing is about the mean square. I think actually, if you could, could get the mean square, you would, you would uh, cut the shortcut about variable selection or these things, whatever, right? So, get the mean square. And like I said uh, yesterday, we, 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 with some with colleagues, uh, Luis and, and Daniel, we had a paper say, as long as you are, forget about no response, you just have the probability sampling, then using any machine learning algorithm or whatever in order to build things, all these things are part of it, we can get the mean square, actually. Now the, the question is just, I think, add one step on it. We do the cause I ran, add one phase, and then the mean square estimation, I think we can use the same approach, generalize it, only under the assumption, when, whenever you calculate the mean square, you have to assume that model is right, and then that, that's the only caveat. So it's like when you compare different mean square, you still need that caveat. But otherwise, I think we, we can do. But still, I think that will give you something rather than sort of. So that's one. And the other thing I think is interesting is about the uh, I'm having the idea is about the, the, the how do you form those cells now? How do you form those cells now? Because uh, uh, together with some 
colleagues asked us, no, 10 years ago, we had a paper in, in, in International Statistical Review. We already had this sentence. The best propensity model will render the propensity approach collapse because the probability is either zero or one. Then this approach collapse. Okay? Sure. So therefore, the best propensity model actually end up with two cells, and then it, the method is not applicable anymore. Right? So this is, this is a problem. So, but this is also interesting. What I think from what you're saying is that what I'm thinking now is that actually the way to form the propensity cell, of course, if you were able to group the units who have relatively close propensities, then it should work. But if you go back to Dalenius' original opposition to this concept of propensity in this context, right? This is really a, a device you invented. It's not like a, it does not exist a long run frequency interpretation of this propensity in most of the cases. If you think about it, the response probability is very different from otherwise we think in a long run frequency type of interpretation or sampling idea. So this is really a device. We shouldn't be fooled by this probability that as if we are catching something, you know what I mean? So I think actually there's another way of trying to form those cells is actually, I don't know if I should say it, but <laughs> okay, you can all go, go and study. I think you should do it so that the key is that the, within the cell, the respondent mean is as close as possible to the non-respondent mean. It doesn't really matter how you form these cells. You can have in the same cell, both people have high response propensity and low response propensity. It does not matter. The key actually matters to in terms of removing bias is that the respondent mean and the non-respondent mean should be as close as possible. You don't have the good variables to predict them, but you may be able to group them so that they have this kind of thing. So you don't have the efficiency by these cells, but you remove the bias. In the, in the case you don't have good x for predicting y. If you have good x for predicting y, just go for them, then that's the safest day anyway. But if you don't have good x for predicting y, actually you should do the cells so that to even out those kind of bias in that fashion, rather than just thinking about you can get the probability close. Because this probability is a mirage to start with, I think. Okay, there are a lot of things to... Uh, to remove the bias when you do cells, you have two choices. Either you do uh, homogeneous cells with respect to the response probability, or you do homogeneous cells with respect to the Y variable. You have to choose it. Now, and you can have a dou even doubly robust cells, right? You can, you can, you can, do that. but the problem is then uh, what Giovanna mentioned, if you do with respect to Y, then which Y? Because you have Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4. This is the issue, right? And this is, the, right, this is the issue. So that's one, uh, the second uh, mention. Yeah, yeah, we, this is, yeah, this is a, yeah, the love, the love will to, to, to be done. Okay, I think we'll have to move on. And, oh, there, sorry. There, there is a question from uh, Web, so yes. I'm just an ambassador. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> could be a good criterion, consider the set of correctors which have minimum coefficient of variation. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Uh, could be a good criterion to consider the set of correctors that have a minimum coefficient of variation. Uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, correctors mean, I guess, predictors. Maybe. So I'm not sure. Maybe. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, the, the, the coefficient of variation is a measure of variance. Yes, uh, weights. The weights adjusted for non-response? Uh, ah, I see, I see, I see. So the, the question, I think it, I understand the question. So is the CV of the weights uh, a, a target? Uh, no, because if this, okay, if, if, if you want the lower CV, then take constant weights, right? And so take, uh, give everybody the same weight, but then you end up with a lot large bias. So you, you don't necessarily want to minimize the CV of the weight. You want to have the smallest CV of the weights, given that you've eliminated the bias, right? So I think that's probably the, what, or, or, or reduce, yeah. So MSC, MSC, right? So it's, uh, okay, do we have uh, Marco online? 
talk about perspectives of the... There we are, yeah. So Marco Dezio will talk about the state of play and perspectives of machine learning in ISTAT. 15 minutes, Marco. Yeah, I, I can see the slides, I don't know. Meanwhile, good afternoon, I'm sorry. I, I would like to be there, but I'm at home because of, of COVID, so I have to stay at home. Um, so I have a few minutes to, just to give uh, 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 the, the state of play of uh, machine learning at Istat. Avanti, per favore. And uh, okay, I will give uh, just uh, a very short uh, um, uh, information on the contest, also uh, coming uh, going to the past. And uh, I will say something about uh, the, the project we are doing uh, with uh, machine learning at Istat and what we have learned and uh, questions that uh, we, we would like to deal with. Some, some of them are also already illustrated by uh, Professor Aziza. Avanti, per favore. So I like it to, to introduce this first studies because uh, uh, sometimes uh, when I go to, to the conferences and uh, listen to people talking about machine learning uh, in official statistics, it seems that uh, never happened before, never, never, uh, nothing was done before. So I like to remember, to remind that this, this pa these mm, two papers where we started uh, from, uh, they are about uh, the use of uh, neural networks uh, for editing and imputation. And this, uh, these two uh, problems are classical problems uh, as I see in the papers. Um, they mm, had nice ideas, but ended up saying that uh, there were problems with uh, scaling up the, the, the methods to, to, the, to the dimension of, uh, of, uh, of big survey at, the, at that time. Avanti. And then a few years later, there were two projects. Uh, one uh, I like to uh, remember is the uh, outing project that, that was aimed at the evaluation of three based methods for imputation. So we are talking about 30 years ago, more or less. And uh, it was also de developed an algorithm that is weighed that uh, was aimed to impute variables, to impute units. And then in uh, 2000, there was the URADI project. We entered the, uh, this project and uh, in a sense, we started our uh, experience on machine learning, even if this term was not used, of course, at the time. Uh, it was a very nice project with 12 participants, uh, university and officials and uh, national institutes. And uh, it was chosen, uh, selected uh, four data sets representing uh, um, different situations and uh, in official statistics uh, from census to other uh, domains. And uh, it was um, some methods like multi-layer perceptron models, correlation matrix memory, self-organizing maps, or vector machines were compared to traditional methods for editing and imputation. So sometimes so I think that we should <laughs> recover some of these papers in order to see uh, the results. By the way, for multi-layer perceptron, again, uh, we uh, the, the project ended up with uh, very promising results, but with problems uh, with, uh, with the machine, at least, that available in, uh, in national institutes at that time. Avanti. Then there were uh, some research papers. But the real boost in ISTAT was given by the, this two memorandum, the Scheveningen Memorandum, Big Data and Official Statistics, and Bucharest Memorandum uh, on Trusted Smart Statistics, because they made the Trusted Smart Statistics uh, more, complete, more concrete in ISTAT, uh, in the sense that ISTAT um, started to invest concretely on these subjects. And uh, the nature of uh, the problems naturally uh, lead us to, to use machine learning methods. Avanti. So, uh, 
thank you. So uh, here it is clear we have a we have many other many many projects on this uh, uh, in this field. I don't want to mention and I don't have time to go into detail and projects, but uh, every project. But uh, I would like to to remind some uh, at least uh, also classified by classes. I would say uh, the first one is uh, devoted to the the use of remote sensing data for urban green. Not only for this, we we have started also working on land cover, but uh, today, uh, yesterday, sorry, uh, you have uh, you have um, uh, the, I mean the the work done uh, in this in this uh, classification problem were presented. Uh, so um, I don't want to get into the detail, but uh, the problem was to to do a, a an unsupervised, unsupervised classifications. Uh, and so k means k medians kernel density estimation can he urge for the detection of the edge of the shape of the green that is important for the classification are used then another project on which we are investing is the use of automatic identification system data these data are uh, signals signals sent by the transponders uh, on vessels and uh, the idea is to use this uh, this information for for improving for, for improving uh, maritime statistics so for 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 timeliness but also for for enriching the information to make them more relevant because uh, all these signals are transmitted by vessels every, let's say, from six to 10 minutes, approximately. So we have a lot of information and we have, in a sense, we can build the route of each single vessel. So we can do uh, much more, for instance, analyzing networks and so on. But uh, there are, of course, many problems. Among them, uh, there is the problem of missing data, and uh, we are trying to 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 work with this problem. And uh, we have started uh, looking at uh, different machine learning models for uh, for imputing data. Uh, the from the first the first uh, applications we 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 saw that the, the most uh, promising are uh, gradient boost and boosting and uh, deep learning. To be honest, uh, there is also a, a vast literature in this uh, field on this, on, this, uh, on this method. So we can also start from these uh, papers. Then another, another um, let's say, a class of uh, um, studies of applications uh, requiring machine learning methods is uh, the sentimental analysis we are carrying out at ISTAT. We have just started uh, working on this topic that is quite new for, a, for an official statistics. And uh, we are working on different uh, um, uh, studies, uh, social mood on economy, on economy index, uh, gender-based violence, uh, hate speech. And for instance, for the social mood on economy index, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, already an experimental statistics that you can find on the web on the ISTAT website. For analyzing these these um, the problems, I mean, for doing these studies, uh, we need some particular mo models like uh, natural language process models, uh, and uh, and then also uh, um, uh, we uh, we resort to the uh, deep learning for classic algorithm. Uh, once we have uh, computed the indicators uh, uh, we need. Avanti. Then we have other applications. Uh, uh, we are conducting with scraping uh, also to to improve the classification of enterprises, for instance, uh, to, to, to classify enterprises in uh, smart or not smart, or uh, even for uh, uh, the classification, automatic classification, we you, you many people mentioned uh, in the, the, those two days, and uh, also uh, smart surveys that uh, Claudia De Vitis presented yesterday. Uh, here, machine learning are 
used for structuring and structured data in order to classify objects acquired from images, physical activities, uh, for instance, uh, uh, by using accelerometer data or leisure as activities uh, using GPS. And, but there are others, but this is just to give you a very broad idea of uh, what's going on on TSS. Uh, and honestly, uh, most of machine learning methods are being used in, the, in this context. Avanti? Okay, beside the, this, this framework, um, in 2019, we um, uh, within the UN Easy Machine Learning Project, we have started uh, studying the use of uh, machine learning uh, for imputation in uh, in contexts where there are multi-source data. Uh, in particular, when uh, administrative data and survey data are are are, um, are used, uh, we have an application. And uh, we applied uh, multi-layer perceptron models for doing mass imputation of uh, the attainable level of education in population census. And uh, we compare this method with the, the official results, the official ones, the, the, the method used for the official ones, um, for the official results uh, is a log linear imputation model. Um, so we compare these two uh, methods in order to uh, see the performance of MLP. Avanti. So very, this is very briefly, and uh, this, let's say, these two three slides was uh, they wanted to give you a very rough idea of what's going on in at instant. For sure, not exhaustive, but I see. I suppose that can they can give a, a, a an idea. Um, so what we have learned, what well, the first the first thing is very as I would say natural. Uh, trust as mass statistics are a natural environment for machine learning. They in fact, at least in the projects I mentioned, they are composed of unstructured data, signals, text, images, and for sure. Uh, machine learning can be can be very useful in this context, but they are also characterized by a very large, a big volume of data. Sometimes in terms of uh, units, sometimes in terms of in terms of uh, variables, uh, and of course these rich models that can be used in the machine learning methods can be can can exploit successfully these the, the richness of this data in these terms and then and then uh, they are essentially can be essentially classified as uh, prediction and classification problems and uh, professor aziza mentioned very well it was very clear the difference between uh, these two the prediction problem and the inference problems um so I would add a fourth point that is that uh, on this data, there is a vast literature concerning these methods. So we generally do not develop new methods. And the fact that there is a vast, measure, a vast literature using machine learning methods in this, in this context can be for us uh, very important. Avanti. Um, here, more things to say uh, concerning the imputation and integration of administrative and survey data. The first, let's say, applications was aimed to understand how to make random imputation and uh, how to use sample weights. Um, the idea, of course, of using a random imputation that is not a, a kind of deterministic imputation in the sense of uh, predicting uh, with a single value given, uh, for instance, by the expectation of a certain model. No, you apply machine learning methods and they give a value. Every time you do that model, you will have the same, like uh, an expected, a conditional expected value. We some most most of the times, at least in this problem, we use a random imputation uh, for for preserving uh, not only 
the mean and the total, but also uh, other other um, moments of the distribution. And uh, that that for us, in order to uh, to 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 experiment the machine learning, because of course, as at least uh, as far as I know, uh, it is not so um, the common to use uh, machine learning models in this uh, way. So we have to think about uh, a, way, a way of doing random imputation with uh, multi-layer perceptron models. Uh, we did it in this context, uh, but I want also to mention the paper by Aziza where there are other suggestions uh, uh, concerning this point. And uh, also sampling weights. Sampling weights is particularly important, of course, when the, the, the sampling design is not, uh, is not ignorable. Uh, but more in general, uh, it would be important to, to use it uh, in the model because, uh, of course, uh, you, the weights uh, are obtained by post ratification or calibration and so on. So um, it, it would be desirable to include sample weights in the, in the, in the model. And uh, also, this problem is not very easy, uh, frequently taken into account uh, in the literature of machine learning. And uh, I wanted to test how to do this uh, in, the, in this uh, context, how to use machine learning with sample weights. Uh, we did it, and uh, we es explored also um, a couple of... Uh, uh, methods for introducing uh, weights in the machine learning, med machine learning uh, estimation uh, step in machine learning model. And uh, this is because uh, it is not always uh, so easy uh, to introduce weight in the, in the package. I mean, not all the packages uh, concerning machine learning methods um, allow to use uh, weights into the model to uh to 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 yes to introduce weight into the models and so we uh explore the uh, the way of introducing uh, simply weights by introducing them in the loss function and uh, by um, uh, let's say using them for uh, creating a sort of pseudo population by exploding data uh, by replicating units according to the weights so the applications uh, study results uh, very, very, very synthesized. Some sense they are similar to official procedures. So on this way, it seems not to have a, a, a gain in the, uh, let's say, the accuracy. Um, probably this is due, due to the fact that there are few explicative variables. So um, probably there is no need to 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 resort to this uh, very complex model that are able to to uh, explain uh, uh, different um, uh, relations. However, uh, it is important for us uh, the study we did because, as I mentioned, uh, we are now we have more ideas. Uh, we are now more, let's say, able to to use uh, sample ways and to make uh, random imputation. Avanti. So uh, next steps, what would, do we intend, what uh, is our intention for the next studies? First of all, uh, <clears throat> we would like to analyze how to deal with longitudinal data. Why this is so important for us? Uh, because we are studying the, uh, the application of machine learning in the field of uh, administrative data. And uh, when you have administrative data, uh, you can have uh, uh, very often a sort of uh, a, a cohort. Uh, you have longitudinal data. For instance, for the, for the uh, level of education, you have uh, the part of the people, uh, of the units of uh, people attending courses. And so, of course, uh, introducing this information can be uh, important for, for prediction purposes. And uh, so we are doing this uh, by using, we have just just uh, started doing uh, some experiments uh, by using LSTM models. Then we would like also to deal with the problem of clustered data. 
because uh, the, when you have, uh, like uh, in the example I mentioned, uh, for instance, a multi-stage sampling, you can have survey of households. And so uh, the units can have uh, uh, an intra-cluster correlation that should be taken into account. These are two important elements for, for us in order to make really uh, concrete introduction of uh, these mod methods in, uh, in, uh, in our study, in our surveys. Avanti. <clears throat> Finally, uh, open problems. And here I have to thank Professor Aziza, not only for the uh, clear, important uh, presentation, but also bec because it, it explained a lot of the contents, the concepts I would have to say here, and um, measures developed for for machine learning are mainly for prediction. So you said clearly that the problem of uh, mean square error prediction that is different from the mean square error of estimator. So. As a statistical institute, we need to, to give aggregates uh, cons um, uh, for which we have a, a measured accuracy. Uh, for instance, uh, we, we need to provide confidence intervals for means, quantiles, or whatever. So that's another problem uh, we, we have just uh, seen. It's ter interesting is uh, not the pro probably also the proposal by uh, Professor Ranalli uh, about the use of uh, cross-validation for the MSE of the estimator. But by the way, for us is a problem. So we wait for your uh, answers. Um, Avanti. Uh, again, on this point, for instance, we could use Bootstrap, but uh, first of all, uh, I don't know if really, uh, it's, it's quite, Computational demanding. I don't know if it is feasible uh, in our in these uh, the, um, processes I mentioned. And moreover, if we have a, a, a survey, we need to deal with complex survey designs. So probably we need to resort to pseudo population bootstrap or whatever. So it is not so 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 easy. I also mentioned multiple imputation because I see that uh, sometimes machine learning is used for for imputation. So that is really less computational demanding. Uh, however, there is a problem, especially with machine learning about proper imputation. In fact, if I uh, use multiple imputation, I, in principle, I can write the model. And so I can, in a sense, use uh, proper imputation by uh, introducing the, the variability of parameters. But if I use a machine learning method, so, that is, a, in fact, a, a black box. Uh, it is different. It is difficult to uh, introduce this kind of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, extra variability unless we resort one more time to a kind of Bayesian bootstrap. Uh, Avanti. So this is the very very quick uh, presentation about the. the machine learning uh, status at least that, but even if of course something is uh, missing. But I wanted to make this last uh, slide that is my personal view. Uh, sometimes we think about uh, risk of uh, concerning bias, accuracy and so on. But I, ha I have also this feeling sometimes when uh, people present, uh, especially outside stat the statistical community, uh, but people from, from uh, I don't know, computer science and so on, uh, talking about machine learning, I have the feeling that they uh, think to delegate everything to the machine. Oh, okay, the machine learning, you, you put data into this box, into this machine, and then you have results. That's, of course, not true. I don't, you know much better than me. At least, I hope uh, you agree with me. Uh, machine learning is a powerful tool. Uh, but research is uh, very important in modeling. For instance, how to deal with, uh, with and model different problems, selection bias, missing data mechanism. I mean, you, can, you cannot only put uh, data into this box saying, okay, input this, uh, this, um, that is uh, missing data. Of course, you have to understand why, understand if there are variables explaining this. Um, 
and when you have to transform from signals to 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 data that we that can be useful for us you are, you have also need to uh, um, understand what's the missing what's the meaning of imputation oh, and for instance dealing with sampling design uh, in fact uh, instead of uh, introducing sampling design ways i can uh, use covariance of design and this cannot be done automatically by the machine but uh, a researcher uh, need to uh, be involved and have a, a relevant role in this step. Avanti. And thank you for your patience and sorry for my voice, very <laughs> deep, not like deep learning. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. We're going to move right on to our next uh, talk <clears throat> by um, Peter Das from Statistics uh, Netherlands. We'll be speaking on machine learning and official statistics towards statistical based machine learning. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for being here the last day of this meeting. Um, I have plenty of time uh, uh, to present uh, our findings, and this is work that I've done together with Marco Putz. We, we do a lot of things uh, uh, together, and it's about machine learning and official statistics. I don't like this, the, the second sentence anymore, but it's about how can we apply machine learning um, in a reliable way. And it's a lot of the ideas are derived from an example that I will introduce as well. So to make clear, it's a classification problem. So that's the context. So any question about other stuff, I will say, no, it's about the classification problem. <laughs> um, and, and there's an important difference between official statistics, statistics and machine learning. In official statistics, we want to produce relevant, objective, and accurate statistics. And in principle, machine learning, I would say data science in general, is about trying to identify patterns in data using various statistical techniques. That's an important contribution to uh, official statistics, and especially if, if you look at how we use, our group uses machine learning, it's about extracting information from text and from images. That's the interesting part of, uh, of uh, using machine learning. Um, but if you open a book on machine learning and you look at the index, it's just an overview of techniques. It's about supervised learning, unsupervised learning, semi-supervised, and then it, it all lists all kinds of algorithms. It, it's like you're a chef and, and you know how to bake potatoes and you know how to fry potatoes and you know how to make pasta, which is a delicate topic, I know. But, but uh, baking potatoes alone is not preparing a meal. So you have to combine those techniques. You have to use those machine learning techniques and, and make a recipe. If you want to cook a meal, it's not about just applying techniques. And, and, and we notice, at least in the context of official statistics, there's a lack of, of proper procedures, how you should use machine learning in that context. So there's a need for methods and a need for methodology. Um, and we claim that machine uh, methodology is not well defined for machine learning, at least in, uh, in a governmental sense. And we want to illustrate, uh, illustrate this need for a machine learning methodology. Um, and I'm really going fast, which is a bit of a, bit of a problem, yeah. But I, I will take my time on this one. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's about a case study. Um, it has a very uh, interesting origin. Uh, it's about detecting online platforms. And if you know, uh, uh, a lot of things I do are related to websites. And this is about, I have a website and I want to know what type of company it is. But it isn't an, uh, a NACE code I'm looking at. I'm looking at a different subgroup of companies. In this case, online platforms. Um, and uh, internal colleagues contact me uh, because our office and the Ministry of Economic Affairs wanted to produce statistics on online platforms. And they started in the traditional way. So they uh, decided, let's send the questionnaire to online platforms. And then they quickly discovered, yeah, but which companies should we send uh, the questionnaire to? Because they didn't have a good overview of, uh, of the online platforms. And in principle, I need 
to explain a bit what an online platform is. Um, in, in principle, an online platform is a digital intermediary service facilitating interactions and transactions between more, two or more sets of users. When I arrived in Rome, I immediately looked down the street to see guys cycling with orange uh, backpacks because that's just eat. That's a typical example of an online platform. At the end of this day, you're hungry, you don't have any energy to cook anymore, so you go to an online website where you order your food, and there are lots of restaurants that want to sell their food online, and they join that platform as well. Just Eat is a typical example of online platforms. Interesting thing is that they have a website, which is great, because that means at least I can use website data to, uh, uh, to identify these companies. And, and the question was, Pete, could you uh, develop a classifier to identify online platforms, uh, uh, websites, with a machine learning approach? And, and subsequently, because the Ministry of Economic Affairs wasn't only interested in identifying online platforms, but also the turnover. And you can scrape the web, whatever you want, but the turnover of an online platform isn't on, online. But it's, a, it's, it's an interesting combination of new and, and more traditional uh, methods. So identify the online platforms in, in the Netherlands with machine learning and subsequently send them a questionnaire uh, where they have to fill in a number of questions. And we also use this questionnaire to validate our model. Are we identifying the companies? Uh, are they really online platforms? If I have time, I will tell an interesting story about that. But this is the focus. So the first step is identifying online platforms and then a the questionnaire will be sent but it's about identifying the online platforms. Now you have to start somewhere. So uh, this is actually the second step we took, but the first thing we did was, okay, do you have any data available? Because um, I'm just gonna develop a model to see if the words on the websites uh, can be used to identify online platforms. That looked fairly well, and then we asked experts for more examples. Can you give us typical examples um, I'm trying to avoid the word representative here, but I will come to that uh, back later. But we asked experts, could you give us a, a, a list of online platforms? Because I need positive cases. You're, you're training a model. It's a supervised uh, classification. You have to have positive examples. Negative examples is not a problem because uh, in principle, we can take a random sample from every website that's associated with a company in our business register. And you will soon find out that most of the time that is a non-platform website. Um, and because you don't know how well the model will perform, we usually start with 50% positive cases and 50% negative cases, just to see what the differences are and if the model makes sense. Uh, we created such a, such a sample, so that's around 1,400, 1,300 uh, uh, websites, scraped uh, the text of multiple pages per website, uh, up to 200 pages, because we want to uh, we wanted to scrape the text from a page on that website that describes what the company is actually doing. So we are hopefully we hope to include relevant words for your model. That's the interesting thing of a machine learning algorithm. You can uh, create a giant matrix of 14,000 words on there, and that machine learning model will try to find the association between being a platform or not, and typical words that occur on the website. Um, try different algorithms. We just try, uh, in principle, all classification algorithms included in the psychic learning library. We all do run this in Python. And our best result was a support factor machine with an accuracy of 82%. It's not really high, but it's enough uh, for the task. So we developed the model based on the examples provided by experts and then class uh, uh, trained it and classified it. The model is not only able to identify a website as a platform or not, but it can also provide a chance, and I have to put that uh, between quotes, of being an online platform. That's in principle a value between zero and one, but that's not a real probability. Certainly not in the case of a support factor machine. I will demonstrate that at the end of the presentation. And we looked at the distribution uh, of the probabilities on the test set, and they had a U-shape, which means that there are more or less two groups in there, which corresponds to an uh, online platform or not. Uh, we do a lot of these checks to see if the outcome of the model makes sense. Just common, common checks. Then we looked at the words that are positively 
positively associated with the online platform, so the, the uh, models with very positive coefficients. And uh, that was fun because the first five words were register, login, the word platform. I thought, yeah, yeah we're measuring something related to that, invest and sign up. So these suggest uh, websites where you have to become a member, login, and the word platform. So it seems to indicate that the model is measuring something related to online platforms. The negative words, uh, yeah, in principle, any other type of website is in there. Non-platforms are, are a huge heterogeneous group. So how did the results look like? Because we developed the model on a, on a limited set and then we applied it to every website uh, that contains words. Uh, that's quite a lot. Uh, we scraped more than 700,000 and 630,000 uh, contained words, enough at least to classify. Uh, uh, them, so we apply the model to that. And what I've shown you here in the histogram is the distribution of the probability values of the model. And there's a huge peak around zero uh, or close to zero. Those are the, uh, 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 the non-online platforms. And that, that peak tails tremendously. And you have to zoom in onto the right to have an idea of something that would suggest that there would be online platform sites there. They have a probability close to one. Uh, but in principle, if you assume that these values are real probabilities, then anything with a score of 0 0.5 or higher is, uh, could be identified as an online platform, which would mean that we have almost 42,000 potential uh, platforms. That we found that a bit strange, so we sampled in, in, in this probability range, and then we discovered that values, uh, values above 0 0.8 or higher, then we saw uh, websites of uh, online platforms. So if you would select uh, those platforms with a value of, of 0 0.8 or higher, then you would end up with 9,387. And essentially, we asked the experts, could you look at these uh, websites and, and uh, uh, select um, uh, the most relevant uh, businesses that are potentially an online platform? Because they didn't want to send uh, almost uh, a bit more than 9,000 questionnaires. They, they were sort of limited to 4,500 or so. So there was a lot of manual work in here, and which is, in, in one hand, a good thing if this is new, because your, your people are checking it, if it makes sense or not. And in the end, they decided to uh, uh, select 4,385 of those uh, 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 businesses identified uh, to send them a questionnaire. There was a response, almost 3,000, and they say that's fairly high for uh, uh, business statistics. I'm not a survey expert, but that's nice. But after doing all this, we discovered, because uh, uh, we did a lot of additional checks and the response, uh, we checked if, if, if it uh, made sense. And then there were questions in that questionnaire related to, is this your website and are you an online platform? In the end, uh, we found out there are about 1,400 online platforms in the Netherlands. That's 0.22% of the total business register. That's a rare subpopulation. I'm not surprised that the original approach didn't work. And uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that um, our model really overestimates the number of online platforms. Because this is not only an a, a NLP task, but it's also uh, identifying a rare subpopulation with a, with a model. So, um, One of the other things I always do is, it's great that this works, but let's try it uh, half a year later or a year later if, and to see what the results are. And the model is stable, so we're collecting variables that are related to online platforms, and it has been used for four years now, this model. Downside of this model is, it really overestimates the uh, uh, number of online platforms. It, it has a serious bias, so, and that means a lot of manual work for the people. And we want to reduce that as much as possible. On the other hand, we have a very interesting methodological challenge here because we uh, uh, this enables us to study the bias of machine learning models. So, what have we learned from this? Uh, there's a real need for machine learning method, method uh, machine learning methodology. Because during this process, we had a lot, a lot of questions. I guess you will have a lot of questions as well in this area. Um, the thing is, how do you usually start? You start with nothing. So you ask experts, give me examples of the positive and the negative cases. Uh, 
it would be nice if we could create a representative training and test set, but in hindsight, you're able to uh, uh, detect that there are about 1,400 uh, uh, positive cases, and we already started with 680, but, but there's, a, there's a catch here. Uh, what's the optimal size of the training set? We just used what we had, and then we decided, okay, if we have 680 positive cases, then let's sample a random sample of 680 negative cases, but you could increase that even further. Um, there's a question about what are the relevant features. There's, there's something funny going on if you use machine learning models and start to increase the amount of data that you use to develop models, and I have a, a picture of that. Um, in principle, machine learning aims to develop a model that is as accurate as possible on your test set, the 30% uh, or the 20% that you, uh, uh, that you don't use. But we want to develop models that are valid on other data as well, on population data, on the target population data. That's what we call external validity. So we want to develop a procedure and the model that comes out of it should work on real world data as well, not only on the data set we use to develop a model. A lot of machine learning stuff purely focus on the data set given and try to develop a, a, a model that works really well on that. But we want to have an externally valid model. Uh, we want to uh, correct the pseudo probabilities of some machine learning classifiers. It would be nice if, they, if we could convert them to real probabilities, because that, that means that we would probably uh, uh, reduce the number of false positives tremendously. And we also want to deal with the intrinsic prevalence of machine learning models. Uh, machine learning models, at least in the classification example, uh, tend to prefer classification on the percentage of positive cases they are trained on. I will illustrate that in a moment. We were a bit surprised that uh, uh, we found that. And in principle, we want to reduce the bias as much as possible. And by reducing the bias of your classification model, we want to uh, reduce the amount of manual work for the people involved. It would be great if your model just identifies the relevant online platforms and then send a questionnaire to, to them as well. Um, I will focus on two, but I will, uh, depending on the time, <laughs> I will come back to the first topic uh, anyway. So the optimal size of the training set is a very interesting one. We, we were a bit limited in this case to, in the beginning, to uh, 680 positive cases. But if you uh, sample, uh, um, if you have data sets of, of, of uh, different sizes, if you start to increase uh, that size of the training set on which you train the model, and repeat that a thousand times, and look, if you look at the, uh, the coefficients and their variance, then you can see that it really reduces if, your, uh, if the size of your data set increases, uh, which is a good thing. And this is an example on other data set, but especially if you have text, then um, that seems to work really well. But overall, the number of variables included, the number of words included, also increases. If the size of your training set increase. So uh, at least machine learning classifiers using text have a tendency to just grow and grow. So somehow more and more words are included in your model. And if you, uh, if you look at, at, at uh, the distribution here, it's clear that the coefficient uh, variance decreases, which is a good thing, but there are two examples where that something else is happening. Somehow they get included in the model because of association with other words. So that's not a good thing. And that also has to relate to the significance of the uh, yeah, machine learners use features, but I'm trying to use variables or words in this case. But if you develop multiple models, every model is a bit different. Every model contains slightly different words. And some words are included, but you can easily remo remove them and still the model performs really well. So that's not what you really want as a statistician, but it's something that happens. So not every feature is, uh, uh, is significant in your, in your model. That's an important point. The other important point we discovered was dealing with the intrinsic prevalence. And uh, we did that while studying uh, the question, yeah, what's the percentage of positive cases that we should use to train a model on? And we start 50-50 is the sort of, a, if you know nothing, you'd start with 50-50 because that's random. So any model that performs better than random guessing is okay. Uh, but if you train three models 
one on 50% positive cases, another one on 25, another one on 75, and you give them test sets with known percentages of positive cases, then something really strange happens. The 50% model performs excellent on 50% on a sample of, on a test set with 50% positive cases, but if you give them more positive cases, it will underestimate the number of positive cases. And it's, if it's the other way around, if you provide it with less, then it will overestimate the number of positive cases. That's what's happening with our classification model. We trained it on 50% positive, but in the real world data there were much less positive cases, so it's, it's vastly overestimating it. Uh, we tried to find literature on this, but we didn't really find a lot. Uh, the point is, um, it is a problem, and we need to develop a correction method. And luckily, Marco <laughs> was involved in this. Um, he worked a lot on this topic. And what he, what he did is he, he looked at it in a, in a Bayesian way. And using the probabilities of the model, he looked at the distribution of the positive and the negative cases in the test set that he used. And from that, he checked if uh, if the number of positive cases was lower or higher than that. Uh, in principle, um, what he tries to do, if you have 50% positive and 50% negative cases, that's the, the upper picture here, then there's a nice cutoff value that you can use. That's exactly where those two uh, distributions uh, connect. But if the ratio is different, for instance, if you have less uh, positive cases, then the best cutoff value isn't on that exact location anymore, it shifts a bit to the right, and he, he tries to correct for that. I always try to explain it as good as possible. If he's online, he will send me a message that I've done something wrong. But that's the principle. You, from uh, the information you have, from the probability you have, you try to look at the distribution and correct for that. Uh, he developed the uh, Bayesian-based uh, calibration approach, which is, in, in principle, a wrapper around the machine learning methods in Python that are able to correct for that. And by correcting for that, the pseudo probabilities also become real probabilities. So that's a very interesting thing uh, that we can do. So if we look at what's, what we have been using for online platform detection, what are the things we have learned and what could we uh, improve on this procedure? So uh, luckily we had a good student that worked on that and a principal Four, uh, the results of four classification approaches are shown here. We used uh, a data set uh, with 30% positive cases and 70% negative cases. Then we applied, uh, uh, we used the, the traditional approach and we know the number of positive cases in the data set and it really overestimates the number of positive cases. It's, it's 2,991 in this case. Then uh, we used uh, the probabilities pseudo probabilities provided by the model and it vastly overestimates the number of positive cases. This, this demonstrates, it became even worse. I will, I will show you a, a graphical representation of the bias in, in the top. So the first uh, example is the standard model, really uh, a large number of false positives. If you use the pseudo probabilities, it becomes even worse. But if you have the pseudo probabilities, you can correct for that by the Bayesian approach developed, and then you can see a real decrease of the bias by the model. So the number of uh, false positives really decreases. Um, but this is the effect of a single model, so a single calibrated model. You can train multiple models on slightly different features. So you use an ensemble of 10 different models. And uh, the idea was that hopefully uh, the bias of each model will uh, yeah, we'll average out. <laughs> and, and we see that that even uh, more increases the bias. It's still overestimating it. it. It's still 306 positive cases on a total of 69. But compared to what it originally was, it's, it's really much better. So in the end, this would be a very interesting procedure that we could apply uh, uh, in production as well to reduce just the number of, of uh, companies that need to be manually checked by, uh, by people. So we're really, really happy with this. Now the conclusions, am I on time? Or? I guess I am, yeah. Yeah. My internal clock says I'm on time, so, okay. So, what have we learned? Machine learning provides us with a bunch of new techniques, which is great, because we, we now can easily uh, include 
unstructured data sources in, in our production process. Uh, but it would greatly benefit from a more methodological approach. Um, in that respect, we can really learn from survey methodology. A lot of the questions I raised are very familiar to survey methodologists, so we have the expertise in-house as well. It's just combining them. Um, what helped us a lot as well was the total survey error thing. Just look at measurement errors and measuring the concept in your population. Um, we need to think about the target population and not only about the data in the training and test set. The, this is a remark that's typically for data scientists or machine learners. They just focus on the data at hand, but don't think about the target population where you should apply it to. And, and the scores of, of at least uh, a lot of the classifiers we worked are, are not actually probabilities, but pseudo, pseudo probabilities. This and other issues are very important when applying machine learning in the context of official statistics. The real challenge in my idea is how do we go from data provided by experts to a real representative data set? Because that would really help to build a, a good model as possible. And that's it. Thank you. So thank you very much, Piet, for sort of sticking to time. And I'm going to steal a few minutes from the closing session um, and uh, open the floor for questions. And if Marco is still online, because we, we, I didn't give it a chance to ask questions to Marco, so if he's still online, uh, you can address questions to him as well. There's a question here in front. Marco online. I had a question to Marco, if he's online otherwise. There he is. Great. Hi. Yeah. So you, you, you're applying, um, in one case, it was heart, observ or heart observation data with machine learning for official statistics. So this lies, you will need three kind of skills, right? Official statistics, you have uh, machine learning, computer scientists uh, with a training in machine learning. Um, maybe this is what is referred to with the term data science, but also health observation, right? Um, so at the some level, w at some point, would you think that it would help to speed up the learning curve um, if you could consult an expert in satellite image processing, for instance? You have here in Rome, we have one of the strongest departments in Telerilevamento, a few steps from here, right? Um, in the same way, as if in 10 years from now, we sit here and we discuss uh, using uh, heartbeat signals with machine learning for official statistics, you will probably consult a cardiologist <laughs> to try to pull some domain-specific knowledge of the input signal. Um, I think it's not a bad idea to, 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 to invite for a drink an expert on the signal, uh, let's say, that you eventually use, because maybe you find out that there is a wealth of well-established tools, methods, techniques uh, uh, that you don't have to rediscover in, in, the, in, in, the, in the best case. It's even, and, and, and I link this with what Pete just showed, it just showed that uh, ML, machine learning, is, is an instrument. And uh, you can use the right instrument in the wrong way. <laughs> and he's calling, actually, to learn to use the, right, the instrument in the, in the right way. So, so let's, um, I think we should, we should also pay more attention to the physics of the signals that we use and talk to the expert to, to, to pull knowledge from them. Thanks. I start, who starts? Mar Let's take another question, Marco. And there was okay. one question okay. online, and then we'll, uh, we'll have uh, your response on Pia. Uh, so thank you for this very uh, clear and inspiring talk, Pete. Um, also, mm, let me ask it that way. Was it a conscious decision that you stayed um, within the information you have from the the website itself, that you advance the mathematical, the, the ML models, uh, or did you have in mind and tried and said, no, that's not a good idea, to, to get some outside information into the model, like 
linking to a business register, like finding out, you know, in this and this NACE classification, uh, platforms are much more um, often found. So is this getting outside information in? Was it a conscious decision that you did not, did not do it, or was it simply too, too, too fussy to do it? Okay, is there any, one more question? Oh, there was an online question. Do you want to read out the question? The, the online question was, in the selection from 9,000 websites to 4,000, did the manual selection align with a threshold value higher than 0 0.8, or was it largely uncorrelated? It's, a, it's an let interesting me, let question. Me read it. In the selection from 9,000 to 4,000, did the manual selection align with a threshold value higher than 0 0.8? or was it largely uncorrelated? Thank you for the question. So I'm gonna let Marco start and then Pat, you can respond. Yeah, <clears throat> yes, a very quick reaction. I completely agree with uh, Fabio, of course, and uh, I really support this kind of uh, multidisciplinarity. Um, that's the reason, for instance, uh, because we have uh, uh, organized this uh, workshop with the universities and uh, also people from uh, NSIs, um, but uh, sometimes it, it is not so so easy to to keep in, to to get in touch uh, with people that are uh, expert of this, the field. For sure, we we will do more than attempt uh, to to try to connect uh, people that are really expert. Of course, we cannot have we have uh, expertise on our uh, fields. And it's important to. To, to to take uh, all the all the the, the 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 experiences. One only one thing is to arrive to people and uh, with the right uh, questions. Otherwise, uh, since most of the times we have different languages, it is different uh, difficult to have uh, useful answers. But I agree completely, and that's the we, that will be the next steps. Thank you. Yes. Um, three questions to answer. Uh, I, I didn't really got the question from Fabio, but in, yeah, but, but in principle, let's let's make it in general. If if you want to use machine learning and official statistics, you need three kinds of people. You need statisticians, machine learners or data scientists, and domain experts, because you can develop really strange things and you think that you've invented the wheel or that you have struck gold, but then the domain expert says, no. <laughs> so that's, that's a very important one. And the question from uh, uh, Magdalena, and I have to think what, <laughs> what the question actually, actually was. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we tried and, and it, it, there are specific NACE codes where more online platforms are active. But in principle, we, we want to have the most complete overview it's possible. And the downside is if you try to look at NACE codes as well, then, then you tend to focus more and more on specific NACE codes. So in the, in the beginning, we just decided, no, let's just see what we come up with. And then later on, because we want to send out a questionnaire, because it, really, uh, it was really good that we got our feedback, because we were really happy with the questionnaire, because that also indicated that we were indeed measuring, uh, detecting online platforms, although we had way too much uh, uh, false positives. I have to say type one errors. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, but, but that was an important check. But, but in principle, anything that we learned from that uh, would be great if you can improve that in, in the future. So it, it, it might help. The other thing, yeah, I, I, I can explain how our internal infrastructure works, but we have a, a web scraping thing where we collect a lot of data and where we develop models and where we run models, and that's a bit separated from our internal highly secure thing where the NACE code information is. So I, we always have to reconsider what we do. So it, it's great. So I prefer to just use the outside environment for all the classification stuff and the, and the webscape thing without any unique identifiers. We have our own identifiers then. So it makes it a bit of a challenge to combine that information. And our internal uh, uh, infrastructure is not always up to speed with the large amounts of data that we need to classify. I'm trying to be diplomatic here. 
Then the final question uh, from the web. Uh, yes, there is a correlation between uh, the fraction of online platforms in relation to the uh, to the probability of the of the model. But it isn't the case that all those 1,400 uh, uh, online platforms are close to 0 0.9 or so. So they are a bit distributed, but above values of 0 0.8, the, uh, they are found. I have to admit that we mainly looked at the false positives, so an additional study might include potentially false negatives, which is intriguing, but it would be interesting to do that, yeah. We are statisticians, so we should check everything. Type two, er two errors may occur as well. Thank you. Great question. So thank. I want to thank all of the speakers for the session, and thank uh, ISTAT for hosting the IASS uh, jointly sponsored uh, session, and thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you for being here <laughs> at this time, attending this closing session. Uh, my uh, closing speech will not last 30 minutes, don't worry. <laughs> Only a few words to conclude this really interesting uh, second ISTAT workshop on methodologies in official statistics, who has, which has been dedicated to the methodological challenges and the opportunities opened by the use of non-traditional data sources and machine learning methods in the production of official statistics. You have uh, seen that during these two days we have discussed about the importance for national statistical institutes to take advantage of the increasing amount and variety of new data sources available in the so-called data ecosystem in order to respond to the ever-increasing information needs coming from the society, of course, uh, keeping survey costs and statistical burden under control, and ensuring the highest level of quality, privacy, preservation, relevance, independence, and transparency of official statistics, all elements that characterize the official statistics uh, mission, mandate. We discussed uh, the, the methodological pros and cons associated with this new uh, perspective, and we share ideas, applications, possible approaches and methods to use this new data, either alone or in combination with traditional data, to extract information from this new data and transform them into statistical information, to assess the quality, let's say, the trustness, of statistics obtained use, using new data sources and or new methods like machine learning that we have discussed in the last session of today. ISAT is investing a lot uh, in terms of resources in uh, all these research areas, also in terms of human resources. You have seen also from the Marco Dizio presentation, which are the most, some of the most relevant uh, studies and applications that uh, we are carrying on, uh, carrying on in, this, uh, uh, in this field. And uh, um, actually some research infrastructures have been created at TSTAT, such as an innovation laboratory, as well as a center for trusted smart statistics, a specific unit to manage the production of experimental statistics, mainly based, but not only of course, but mainly based on the use of new data sources, and which are supervised by the ISTAT Research Committee. ISTAT researchers are involved in a number of international and specifically European projects. Fabio has disappeared, but 
he informed me about that, because I want to uh, underline this respect, the key role of Eurostat in supporting research projects also on topics related to the use of non-probabilistic data sources in official statistics. And during this workshop, some of uh, uh, the, the projects which are ongoing, which are starting in this uh, uh, area, uh, have been uh, uh, also illustrated, the, the project on smart surveys, the project on the use of uh, uh, mobile network operators next year, a project on the use of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in official statistics uh, uh, will, uh, will also start. Uh, so for ISTAT, it's essential not only to continue investing on these issues, but it is important to continue doing it by collaborating with other national statistical institutes um, to develop common solutions to common problems, but also involving the academic world and the other research institutions. Um, and of course, finding discussion spaces like this workshop. My opinion, I, I hope that, that you uh, share my opinion, this workshop has been a useful opportunity to align ourselves with uh, each other on the state of the art and on the current methodological advancement in this increasingly important field for public research. So before concluding, on behalf of ISTAT, uh, let me thank again the coordinator of the ISTAT Advisory Committee on Statistical Methods, Professor Daniela Cocchi, who also chaired this workshop and all the committee members for chairing the various sessions and for their very stimulating discussions. Professor Giovanna Ranalli, Professor Li Chun Zhang, Professor Brunero Liseo, Dr. Piero Falorsi, and Professor Natalie Shlomo, uh, also as president of the International Association of Service Statisticians. So many thanks again to Professor Wu, Professor Iacus, and Mr. Ricciato for their very interesting and useful master classes. And, uh, to all the speakers who contributed to the various sessions, among them the new members of the ISTAT Advisory Committee, Professor Aziza and Professor Das. Many thanks to the ISTAT Scientific Committee for its great job in contributing to the preparation management of the scientific part of the workshop under the supervision of Dr. Mauro Scanu. And, uh, Many thanks to the colleagues from the ISTAT communication and IT departments for the careful organization and technical support provided to this meeting. So finally, many thanks to all of you for attending this workshop in presence or online, and see you next year for the third edition of this event again here at ISTAT. Thank you very much.